Welcome everybody to the second part of our Great Contact Lens event series. We're going to be talking about daily disposables with an tr a true expert in this category, Dr. Sue Resnick. My name is Dr. Stephanie Wu. I am the founder of Wu University, and I will be your host for this evening. Dr. Resnick is uh, is a wonderful person and somebody that I have come to to know very well. She is the president and managing partner of Dr. Farkas Castello Resnick and Associates, which is a contact lens and anterior segment specialty practice with locations in New York and Long Island. She received her doctor of optometry degree from this, the State University College of Optometry in New York. And Dr. Resnick has devoted her clinical career of over 30 years to specialty contact lens fitting, ocular surface wellness, and refractive surgery co-management. Dr. Resnick is a diplomat and committee sub-chair of the cornea contact lens and refractive surgery section of the American Academy of Optometry, the American Board of Optometry, and a fellow of the Scleral Lens Education Society. So Dr. Resnick has been uh, the gas permeable lens practitioner of the year uh, in 2019, and she's had many, many different awards. She's given many different lectures. And I will tell you that when I was thinking about starting my specialty contact lens practice, I reached out to Dr. Resnick and she was so kind to answer my questions. And she really encouraged me to do it and take the leap. And, um, and you just, you, you gave me so much confidence to start this journey. And I just, I know that you are just so excited to give this presentation and, and be with our audience, but it is, is truly an honor for me to, to be with you this evening and welcome to Wu University. Well, thank you so much, Stephanie. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, and thank you everybody for joining and thank you to Cooper Vision for sponsoring this event. <clears throat> and I'd love to be able to mentor and you were, you know, one of the people that I got the most pleasure out of speaking with. And all I kept thinking is, please come to New York. Please come to New York. But anyway, I'm glad you're doing well out West. And um, we'll have to find somebody else for our practice. But we do have two good associates with us. So this is a little unusual for me. Uh, not unusual, but I'm typically talking about very complex specialty medical lenses. And here tonight... I'm going to be taking a deep dive into daily disposables. And what's interesting is as I was getting this together, I'm thinking, wow, these little lenses that could, they are perhaps more sophisticated and more elegant than some of the fancy schmancy sclerals we're using. And more than that, when you think about daily disposables, this is the bread and butter of most of the patients we see most of the day in most of our practices. So what are we going to go through? I'm going to take you through a little historical ride with me. Some of you weren't even born when the first day disposables came to market. Uh, I was. Um, I was actually one of the first to have access, early access to the first lens on the market. And what was interesting is back then, before the lenses were even launched, we had a list of about a thousand patients that were already interested in dailies before the lenses even came out. So I'm gonna take you through prescribing trends. Where are we today? We're gonna to go through all the benefits, but mostly what I'm gonna want you to focus on is what makes each lens unique. Because as I like to say, you never fit the patient to the lens, you fit the lens to the patient. And it's only by virtue of understanding the differences that you can make that clinical match. And at the end, I'm gonna give you the resonant guide to matching. It's not based on a study. It's not based on scientific evidence. It's based on what has worked for me. You can love it, leave it. But the idea is to come up with your own, come up with a rationale and come up with a plan. So here's a little history. We can march up the ladder. This is my by no means all inclusive. It just highlights specific designs and specific materials that have come out over the years. And just to put it in perspective, the first disposable soft lenses were in 1987. Those were the two-week active view. The daily disposable lenses were launched in 1995. We had them in 1993. 
It wasn't until 1998 when the true eye came onto the market that we actually had a silicone hydrogel. And then in 2013, we had the water gradient contact lenses, the daily total one. To me, it feels like it was yesterday. I couldn't believe it was 2013, but it was. And now we're getting into myopia management and we're fortunate to have the MySight lens, which was launched in 2019 and some others. So we're gonna be talking about what's happened now. What actually had to happen to manufacturing to get these lenses where they are? Um, companies had to ramp up their manufacturing to make it more cost effective. So they had to use robotics and computerized inspection of the lenses. Um, and J&J &J was the first to implement it. They took it from a Danish engineering uh, platform called uh, cast molding or soft cast molding. And that worked very well. And they continued to uh, update it. Then they gave, got a second platform called the Maximize. And then a year or two later, SIVA came out with yet a better, not a better one, but a different one that eliminated uh, one of the steps that was very time consuming. And they used their light stream kit technology. So they actually brought the cost down a little bit for those of you um, that are following the history there. So where are we in terms of our prescribing of daily disposables? This is a look back two years. Uh, these, as you know, contact lens spectrum publishes every year. They take a survey of practitioners and it's always a year look back. I went back to 2020, just to the kickoff or the end of the century, uh, the decade, I should say. And so you can see where we were. So the US um, you know, was kind of at the, the head of the bottom third of the group. We were at 45%, but you can see Denmark was in the lead close to 70%, and uh, Colombia, South America uh, was bringing up the bottom at about 8%. So there is a variability globally. But where are we in terms of the US? So if we look at the percentage of daily disposable lens fittings in the United States over the last 10 years, we have been on a steady rise, and we'll talk about why that is. We're all embracing them more, but you know, why are we embracing them more? Um, what's very interesting to me is if you look at the difference between 2019 and 2020, uh, you'll see a big leap. And I have to think that with the concerns of COVID and infection, that might have kind of, um, you know, prompted more patients. I know in our practice, more patients were asking about cleaning habits. They were more concerned about infection and they were more concerned about uh, disposability. Uh, if you look at the breakdown here in terms of, well, how does daily, uh, you know, daily disposable hydrogel uh, compare to silicone hydrogel? Obviously, there was a, you know, there's trending towards silicones because all of the new launches, well, I shouldn't say that. Many of the new launches have been in the silicone category, but we do have a few wonderful products that are still HEMA-based. And we're going to talk about the silicone versus the HEMA Dilemma, is one better than the other? Why or why not? We're gonna to get to that in just a few minutes. So what's fueling the growth? And these are three things that come to my mind. In the old days, like in 30 years ago, when daily disposables first came out, daily disposables were considered a niche product. You know, it was for the well-heeled that wanted to spend the money, that wanted the luxury, that wanted the convenience, but it's becoming much more of a workhorse. And I think we all treat it that way. So we have more new wearers starting in daily, certainly. Parents now <clears throat> are asking to be fit after their kids are fit, right? So especially now for seeing kids for myopia management, we're putting them in daily disposable. Parents are like, well, can I have that? Um, and we certainly have more parameters in optical design, so we're able to accommodate more astigmats and more presbyopes. The cost versus value thing always comes up in every discussion about daily disposables. And, Certainly, as the more options have become available, the cost disparity has decreased. We always talk about, you know, telling patients, subtract the cost of solutions. Uh, we have wonderful rebates for most of the companies. So I do believe that you can make lenses affordable for most people if they want them. And in the third category, there's, I think, a word that I invented. It's, I call it technocentricity. And what I mean by that is that patients are used to upgrading their stuff every few years, whether it's their iPhone, their laptop, their TV. Even when you look at, pe at people buying cars now, they're not kicking the tires. What are they doing? They're looking at the bells and whistles. They're looking at, well, what electronics do I have? What do I have that's gonna allow me to interface? Um, so they're into the technology. And that's why I think it's important for us to concentrate on the technology because when you're talking to patients, 
you've got to kind of draw them in with why you're talking about a specific lens and why is it pertinent to their particular either physiology, lifestyle, or prescription. <clears throat> so why choose one-day lenses? Let's break it down into four categories, safety, compliance, part-time wear, and practice benefits. And I think these probably cover most of what we need. So if we just go down here to the box on part-time wear, um, this study in contact lens spectrum, which was just published, shows that there are 10% of patients who wear their lenses part-time, and they define that as equal to or less than three days a week. So we still have a good opportunity to recommend daily disposables for patients who want to be in their glasses most of the time, um, but are the weekend warriors or you know, need them for vacation or travel. So let's get a little, dig a little bit more deeply into the safety component now. <clears throat> I love this survey from Cooper Vision. They did this in 2015, um, but I, I, I think it's still very, very relevant. And they took uh, about 1,200 responses from contact lens wearers that were adults. And they found that patients really care about their health. And when choosing between two brands, only the vision quality ranked higher than health in respondents' decision. So when you're giving patients options, you can shoot right for the health card. Um, you know, convenience comes to mind, but they're interested in the health. And price, keep this in mind, price ranked fifth as a determining factor. And 95% of those that are health conscious are willing to pay a, a higher price for contacts and ensure eye health. So it's important that health be the, the lead in your conversation. So this is one of my favorite slides. I called it OO. Um, and these are statistics that Ralph Stone came up with. And this was, you know, back in 2007. And I like to think we have improved since then, but I thought these were interesting. Three in five contact lens wearers don't wash their hands. I think it's probably better now with COVID. One in five were not using fresh solution every time they store their lenses. And we know that's a big problem with reusable wearers. Two in five people have put contacts in their mouth to clean. Yuck. And seven in 10 admit to swear, swimming in their lenses. So we know these are really all very high risk factors for infection. So what is that, how does that relate to daily disposables? Well, we're gonna look at what has daily, have daily disposables done to improve safety? So if we look at these three main clinical adverse events, which is a papillary response, infection and allergies, we know that daily disposables have had a significant impact um, you know, in all of these. And as a matter of fact, the thing that I loved most about dailies when we started fitting them was I was no longer getting those emergency calls. And those had, you know, kind of started wearing out. I loved working. I just didn't love working, you know, Sunday morning at eight o'clock or Saturday, you know, night, you know, two in the morning. So it really relieved us of those emergencies. So let's start with GPC. And believe it or not, it was back in 1974 it was an Australian ophthalmologist named Thomas Spring, and he was the first one to kind of coin the phrase. It used to be thought that GPC was really like an IgE-mediated allergy, like a seasonal allergy, but we know that it's not. It's actually due to trauma on the inside of the lid. Once that tissue is traumatized, the immune system is activated, and then it becomes more activated or exacerbates the immune reaction when it is exposed to antigens and so proteins and mucus on the lens. So when you think about GPC, it has to do with the modulus, the edge design, the smoothness. And then of course, it relates to how frequently patients are replacing their lenses. Um, so there was a study published in 1999 that looked at a number of contact lens wearers and GPC was present in 36% of patients whose contact lens replacement schedules exceeded four weeks, compared to only four and a half percent who change contact lenses more frequently than every four weeks. So I think we all have witnessed that, that in our practices, that the more you change the lens, particularly with dailies, there's very, very little GPC, and especially with the wonderful new edge designs that we have. So what about infection? The likelihood, there are two studies that came out interestingly in 2012. One was by Robin Chalmers and the other was by Stapleton and Korn. And if you, if you remember no other statistics, these are the ones to remember. 
the likelihood of having a corneal event is 12 and a half times greater when wearing reusable lenses compared to wearing daily. And the rate of developing a moderate to severe keratitis is half that of the rate with traditional daily wear lenses. So what does that mean? It means that when adverse events do occur with daily disposables, it's very mild. And I think we've all seen the occasional infiltrate. It's usually sterile, it's usually peripheral, and we usually don't even know what causes it. Um, but I mean, I, I don't wanna jinx myself here and be called in tomorrow morning, but I haven't seen a true cordial ulcer in a long, long time. So let's move to allergy because um, this is gonna be important when I introduce at the end um, a new technology that we're gonna be hopefully having soon. But seasonal allergy and contact lens wearers can cause significant comfort issues, uh, hyperemia, tearing. And in one study here, out of 128 patients, 67% experienced increased comfort with dailies. And only 18% of those who wore one month disposables while versus only 18% uh, who wore um, monthly disposables. So we know that the high replacement frequency alleviates the symptoms and improves the comfort levels by you know, reducing the buildup of denatured proteins and antigens. So I think we're all familiar with, you know, the, the, more, the more frequently you use disposable lenses, the fewer the allergy symptoms. So let me fast forward you now to this very recent study, which was just published in Clinical Optometry. This was done by a Japanese group. And the purpose of the group, they were really looking, um, for those of you who don't know, in Japan, colored lenses are very, very popular. They were really looking at allergy um, sufferers who wear colored lenses, but their study was interesting because they looked at 12 different types of soft contact lenses, many of which are the same that we have here in the States, a few were different. So what they did was they took pollen particles and they exposed the contact lenses to them for an hour, then they rinsed them off, and then they looked at them under the microscope and they looked at the concentration of pollen that remained on the lens and the area of pollen attachment. So what did they find? They found that there was a large range from zero to about 293 pollen particles per 400 square micron area. But interestingly, in these daily disposables, very little of the surface area was affected. So you're looking at a hundredth of a percent of just a little over 3%. Um, but they did note that there were significant differences between the different lenses. But I think the take home is that in general, daily, uh, pollen doesn't stick to most of the modern dailies, and when it does, it's in a low concentration and in a low, um, a small area of the lens. Uh, but the winner in this particular study was Delafilcon for having the fewest pollen particles. So let's um, now look at compliance with single-use lenses um, with respect to three factors. We're gonna look at adherence to the manufacturer's replacement schedule the eye exam interval and practice economics, because uh, we'll see in a minute how important this all comes into play and how these factors interrelate. So we've all witnessed the effects of daily disposables have on compliance and the studies support these observations. Here's one in particular done by Aaron Ruff, uh, published in 2019, showing that there is greater compliance with daily disposable. Um, monthly comes in second and two comes in third. I think that Industry has taught us all that. Um, what was interesting is that they found that, um, this was a non-clinical study and they found that 94% of wearers told to replace their lenses every day actually did it. So that makes compliance good. How is that additionally beneficial? Well, let's look at compliance versus eye exam interval. So the, the greater the compliance with the actual replacement, the better the patient does at showing up for their exams. And we all know what the economic input or effect of that will have. So let's take a look at that um, just to see what it shows us. So just a number of just different studies that I pulled. So if you let, let's say, seven more months lapse between your exam, you're leaving 20% of your revenues on the table. Um, if you look at this data from 2018, uh, and it shows that the median complete eye exam revenue is $346. So, you know, and that's just the median. And I think most of us could probably do better and probably do better. Um, 
But if your patient isn't coming in yearly, you are, you know, you can do the math. You are fractionally reducing your revenue. And then the third thing to think about here is, you know, contact lens dropouts. We talk, we talk about that all the time, but I would encourage you to look at your numbers. We do in our practice, we do a monthly um, tally of how many new ones came in, how many patients we lost. Uh, it gives you a really good idea of how you're doing. Um, because how do you keep patients in the practice? You address their needs, but you get them into the lenses that make the best match for them. So here's an example. We have, let's say, 3,100 patients, which I think is a typical practice size. You know, roughly 30, a third of them are wearing contact lenses. The average annual value being 275, it's probably a little higher now, uh, with an average of 16% dropout rate. So, you know, you're losing 169 patients a year that way. And, you know, the annual economic potential is $46,000. So if you take away, you know, 16%, you're losing a lot of money. So the idea is that daily disposables are probably your best bet at keeping patients comfortable, reducing risk, getting them into their appointments. So what has the industry done to help us do that? So there are two broad categories here. Uh, the strides that they have made are optimizing comfort and health, and they've done that with new materials and advanced lens features. And they also have done that by providing with us with more parameters. If you remember back, you know, when lenses first get launched, it's first the spheres and then the torques and then the multifocals, and we still do that. But if you remember from the timeline, we have an, you know, an incremental, almost geometric um, introduction of new products to the market. So we're going to talk about that now. So they're coming at us more furiously and faster. And boy, do we enjoy that. Okay, so let's look at material properties. And I, um, you know, the focus of research and development in contact lens polymers continues to be finding just the right balance of material properties. And we have to look at the influence of each on ocular physiology and the relationship to patient comfort. So the first topic of conversation, you know, when you put any meaning is oxygen. Yeah, oxygen's important. Um, nobody's going to deny that. But when you think about oxygen, it's not the end all and be all. And according to the Tear Film and Ocular Surface Society's International Workshop on Contact Lens Discomfort, and I would encourage you all to read it, it's a very short one, uh, and they do an amazing job. They say that stricter experimental designs are needed to prove that oxygen permeability and not factors um, such as surface and bulk properties increases contact lens comfort. Um, so we're gonna look at that in a minute, but this is a busy slide, let me take you through it quickly. So we had, everybody's familiar with the Holden and Birch criteria from 1984, uh, 24DK for healthy daily wear. How do we um, judge health? We judge it, uh, we compare it to the open eye state without a contact lens. We know the cornea swells four and a half percent in the closed eye state. We want that cornea to deswell quickly upon awakening. And we want there to be no more than four and a half percent swelling, obviously at any given time. Uh, Holden revised, uh, gave us numbers of about over a little over 100 for extended wear. And then Brennan told us we needed about DK of 20 centrally and 30 peripherally. So these things have been revised over the years. And this study was published by Desmond Fong in 2005. And they reevaluated and they said that to preclude hypoxic changes, we want lenses to have a DK of 25 or 30 for daily and 125 for extended wear. So pretty much every single lens on the market is going to deliver the oxygen we need to meet these minimum criteria. If you remember, silicone hydrogels really came into existence because we thought we were going to put it, we we're going to have a happy ending to extended wear, and that never came about. We thought that's why corneal ulcers were forming, and that proved not to be true. Now, we love silicone hydrogels because if you can give more oxygen, why wouldn't you? But on the other hand, if you can't, you don't have to, you know, and not every person has to be in a silicone hydrogel, and not every patient can wear one. And then this final study was published more recently in 2018 by Loretta Schott Flynn um, and colleagues. And they looked at Edifilcon, which we all know is kind of the prototype lens that J&J &J came out with, the, you know, the one day AccuView. And they looked at corneal swelling, limbal hyperemia, endothelial bruids, 
and they came up with that they were they were non inferior. So you know there was parity in the oxygen delivery to the cornea. So oxygen aside, let's look at three components of contact lens materials and how they relate to patient comfort, because that's really what we're interested in. Yes, we want the corneas to be healthy, but we already established we have enough oxygen. So that's the research that guided the development and improvement of contact lens materials in general, but specifically e even more in the daily disposable space. Uh, so Coles and Brennan made a statement, the principal lens property associated with end of day comfort is coefficient of friction. And it's a little hard to read, but these three graphs. So the first one is comfort versus um, oxygen, comfort versus modulus, comfort versus coefficient of friction. Um, and you can see that if you look at the R scores, the correlation scores, the highest correlation was indeed in the lubricity, in the smoothness of the surface of the material. So what are the compatibility challenges? What have these companies done? How have they risen to the occasion for us in helping us improve the ecosystem of the ocular surface? Well, think of it this way. The contact lens we know lacks mucus attaching properties, so it can't hold on to the mucus. There are certain properties, phosphatidylcholine, and some of the things that you already know about that do help to attract are a little bit mucinogenic, um, certainly uh, lipophilic, but we really don't have a mucus attaching contact lens. So what happens is, if you don't have that mucus, the contact lens is unable to support the, the tear layer thickness that we want. So the tears evaporate, you get stress of the ocular surface, but you also get friction. And if you remember back to that slide of the lids, you know, you have the lid wiper, which is that little area of cells just anterior to the margin or posterior to the margin before you hit your columnar epithelium. None of that epithelium was designed to be rubbed on anything but the human tear film. So the goal is for these companies to make the surfaces of these lenses as close to the lubricity of the human tear film. So how did they do that? So I'm going to go through this now in chronological order. I am talking about brands because I have to, and I'm not going to apply. No, there's no one brand that's better than the other, except for the brand that works on your patient. But it's important for you to know that these lenses are different. So the water gradient technology by Alcon uh, is given to us in the daily total warm. They have other lenses as well, the precision as well. But this was the first lens, and they managed to bring a very nice six micron cushion of moisture to the surface of the lens. Their core material is, uh, you know, pretty high modulus of 0.7, uh, very high DK over T, but that cushion of moisture on the surface of the lens makes the lens very lubricious. Let's go to 2015. What did J&J &J do? Well, they came out with their Hydrolux technology. And so what they did was they took a silicone that was, um, you know, fairly water friendly, um, and they also um, cross-linked it with PVP, polyvinyl pyrrolidone, which is amphiphilic. And they used this, uh, they cross-linked it with the self-hydrating polymer. And they put a lot of the PVP in there to make it very, very smooth and make it a very fine network. So not only did it result in a smoother surface, uh, but it also was nice because it prevented adhesion of the lens to itself and also to the molds when they were manufacturing it. So it's an enhanced moisture network, tear-like molecules combined with hydrated silicone. So you can see just between these first two, um, Alcon used all of their stuff on, most of the stuff on the surface. J&J &J had it more infused throughout their whole lens. It was more of a bulk property manufacturing. 2015, my day, Aquaform, very, very different. They used long silicone hydrogel change, which are naturally um, wetting, and they were able to reduce the silicone, uh, which gave a lower modulus lens, made it softer. And using the long change meant, change meant that less silicone needed to be used. So there's no surface technology here. This is a naturally uh, wetting lens and a naturally, um, you know, permeability, it has, has good permeability. Uh, because of the way the silicone chains come together. 
Um, and there's a lot of water in this lens. It's 54%. It's a nice low modulus of 0.4. So remember I talked about the oxygen thing. Simplifies came out with their lens. That's why Synergize in 2019. What did they do? They went back to good old Edifilcon. Okay, fine. We already said that. You don't necessarily need a silicone. But what did they do? They took tangible um, polymer. For those of you that fit a lot of hard lenses, you know of tangible hydropeg, the same company. They use some of the polymer in the soaking solution, in the packaging solution, and some of the polymer is actually, it's coated on the lens, and it's at a Philcon. So they took a, you know, a nice tried and true comfortable material and enhanced it by using uh, polyethylene glycol, which is what tangible hydropeg is. So you're getting the picture now, right, of how every company comes up with something a little different and a little more special. Okay, we're getting there, kids. 2020, uh, Bausch & Lohmann Fuse. Very, very unique. They actually infused the lens with EVP, and then they used surfactants, to uh, peloxamine and peloxamer. They also then used ingredients that are present in many eye drops. Osmoprotectants, erythritol, which is a natural sugar produced by mushrooms, and glycerin, which we know also is an osmoprotectant, and they added electrolytes. Some of these elute through the day, most of it, some of it still remains in the lens towards the end of the day, so that it's not crispy at the end of the day. It's a very nice wedding lens. Um, they did come up with a brand new silicone hydrogel. This is not, uh, you know, a, re, a redone, a remake of a, of a current material. Uh, very low modulus, very high decay. So again, this is a nice lens uh, for patients that, you know, might have some dry eyes uh, or you need a low modulus lens for. Okay, so now we talked about what the companies have done to improve the materials. Where are we in parameters? And you guys can look this up. I'm not giving you, you know, uh, the, the class supplement to uh, everything, but I just wanted to make uh, just a couple of call outs here. Um, so in the spheres and the, uh, the spheres first, um, we now can go from minus 12 to plus eight, and we have AccuView, Precision One, and My Day doing that. The multifocals are getting cooler and cooler. Um, natural View actually goes to a minus 12 and a quarter. Uh, Daily's Total One and Procolate go to a minus 10, but My Day now goes to a plus eight. I have been begging for high plus and multifocals for years. So thank you to Cooper Vision. Torix, now Dr. Paul is gonna do a great lecture next week on Torix on how to fit them, what the different designs are. So I'm not gonna get into that, but I just wanted to highlight what the, um, what the, the new additions to our armamentarium are. Uh, my day has come up, uh, goes up to a plus six. And in the BioTrue one day for astigmatism, they're giving us a nice expansion here. The cylinder goes up to a minus 275 and it's available in six axes. Stay tuned for the Alcon Precision One and Daily's Total One Torix and limited parameters. I've been using them for a while. Again, if this is a, a piece of materials that you like, uh, it's nice to be able to correct the cylinder. So we all look forward to those. So, you know, think about all of these lenses we have at our disposal, no pun intended, and we are getting better equipped every year. Which brings me to presbyopia. Now, Dr. Kuhn did an amazing talk last week, and um, this is probably the most challenging refractive state, I think, to satisfy. But the manufacturers have continued to innovate to provide us with great options, and Having a broader selection yields greater success rate. But again, this is predicated upon having an understanding of the differences in designs. Because if you're working with a patient and you try one, and then you go, okay, I'm gonna try number two. Well, don't pick lens number two that's, that, that's too similar to lens number one. This is why you need to understand the differences. And as we learned last week from Dr. Quinn, there's a commonality to the successful approach no matter what design you choose. It's all about the creative and careful verbiage you use when dispensing and upon follow-up. And the one thing I noticed from Dr. Quinn's talk was that he never invoked the word compromise. Um, 
And, and that's a good thing. And it's not about what these lenses may not do some of the time. It's about what they can do all of the time. So just keep that in mind. But here are my pearls. You got to know the design. You got to follow the fitting guide, folks. Don't get fancy. You may think you know better than the companies. I will tell you in this space, you do not. <laughs> Use real life viewing. Don't put the chart up there. Give them a cell phone. That's what they want to look at. Um, normal room illumination. And I see these people back quickly because I don't want them floundering out there saying, oh, these babies aren't working or why did I do this? So I want to get them before they get too frustrated. So I typically see my presbyop my presbyops back uh, within a week versus, you know, for some patients, two weeks. So I'm going to take you through a little historical um, uh, trick here. And I'm, I'm coming back to the 2012 now, which is the ProClear One Day Multifocal. And you may be thinking, this was supposed to be an update. Why is she talking about the One Day ProClear Multifocal? Well, I'll tell you why. For a couple of years, this was the only game in town. And interestingly, many of us had a lot of success with it and still do. The ProClear material is a very interesting material. It's great for dry eye and this lens is a great way to bridge the gap between monovision and multifocals. And many of us still do a little bit of modified monovision in the beginning with patients, even though theoretically maybe we shouldn't. But what, what I really love about this lens, it remains a great choice for true bilateral multifocal intolerant patients. So in other words, patients that really can't process simultaneous vision, this lens works really, really well. Um, recall that you're going to push plus on the distance, uh, push plus to full distance in the dominant eye, and then boost uh, the non-dominant eye with various strengths, usually up to three quarters. So it's a great lens for your early presbyopes or your true multifocal intolerant patients. Okay, so now let's go, you know, 2014, we had the BioTrue one day. Um, they call it a three-zone progressive. So it is a progressive, but within each zone, there's a constant, a consistent area of um, focus. Um, the one-day moist multifocal came out a year later. What was different about that lens is that they optimized the people. And that has been my kind of pet peeve over the years in that, you know, the pupil is a pain in the you-know-what when it comes to fitting multifocal lenses because... It can't be too big and it can't be too small. It changes with the refractive error. It changes with the patient's age. And luckily, j and recognized that, and they did a nice job of trying to work that in. And so this lens will work out for some people that are pupil sensitive. Um, the Daily's Total One came out in 2016. This is a true aspheric, very smooth transition. Uh, you have to follow the fitting guide. It's a very special one. And then... Most recently is the My Day Multifocal. Um, for those of you who haven't started fitting it, I have. Um, it's very nice. Um, they did a very interesting thing. So we have in the low and the medium ads, we have, you know, the zones here where you can see the near, the intermediate, and the distance. Uh, they change the, I call it the real estate of the lens when I talk to patients, uh, depending on which it is. Um, and it's aspheric, but what they did in the high end was they used a center zone that was spherical. Um, and so for those patients who you need to put the high end in, it really does boost the reading. What's really cool about the lens also is that you always fit the low end on the dominant eye and you only change the lens in the non-dominant eye. So again, you got to read the, the fitting set, the fitting guide. So you know, if I was going to give you sort of my personal pearls, um, there for patients who have larger pupils than average or smaller pupils than average, I would look to something like a my day or a moist, as opposed to somebody whose pupils are fairly average. Uh, and again, it's hard. We're talking about tenths of millimeters, but just a little guide. So this is the newest lens um, on the market. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Miru. Um, it's by Menicon. They came out with this material called Mitophilcon, and they promote it as having um, 
uh, two things. Well, one is their smart touch package. I don't know if you guys know about that, but the lens actually rests concave side down. You just touch your finger to the lens, you pull it off. So the patient doesn't have to fish for the lens and they can put it right in your eye, which was a very novel little um, bell or whistle, whichever you want to call it. Um, they use a new Sci-Hi where they polymerize uh, HEMA materials and silicone materials. And then they talk about their Nanogloss Pro, which is really just two types of plasma. One's an oxidation and one's um, a plasma coating. And you can see here the parameters. And again, it's, a, um, it's an aspheric lens. So uh, that's a nice option for, um, you know, for your presbyopes also. I have not yet started to fit this lens. It literally was just launched a month ago. So I moved Natural View over, even though it was 2017, because I'm going to bridge a little bit into myopia management here. Um, so the Natural View is our only extended depth of focus lens. It creates a virtual aperture by having a very steep hyperopic uh, drop, if you will. And so you're suppressing cortically. And so this lens, um, you know, works for, you know, a lot of presbyopes. Uh, it's nice. Uh, but I think most of it are using it, and let me state this, at least six times. It is off-label in the United States for myopia management, um, but it has been approved in a lot of other countries around the world. Um, it is an effective lens, um, and it's a daily disposable. Uh, you can go on to Visionary Technologies' website. You can look at their studies. They did an amazing one with chicks where they actually, actually reversed uh, induced myopia. And you know, I'm not going to argue study strength. That's not what I'm here for. I'm here just to kind of tell you what's available. Um, but they do retrospective analysis as opposed to Cooper, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, that actually did controlled prospective analysis. But their numbers were very good, you can see here. And a lot of us have had a lot of success with the lens. Uh, what's nice with this lens is that it, it is available in higher powers should you have, you know, more advanced myopes and want to sort of intervene a little bit later on with them. So it is a nice lens for um, myopia progression control. Their six year data looks like this. Um, you know, they got, they showed good results. They showed 95% showed a decrease in progression uh, with 78% showing 70% or more. This was on 196 subjects, six years of data, 15 practices and Looking at axial length, it was slow to the normal rate of change expected for non-myopic children in that similar range. So they basically did a data comparative analysis. So now let's move to the MySight, which is the newest entry to the myopia management armamentarium. And this is manufactured in a proclear material. So it brings me back to, you don't need sci high. We're dealing with children. Uh, it's a very nice lens. They use the ProClear lens. Uh, it consists of concentric rings with alternating treatment and correction zones. The treatment zones provide plus two diopters of defocus. Now, it does, these lenses don't change accommodation or phoria, so they shouldn't be considered as similar to multifocal contact lenses. They're specifically for myopia management. And you, you choose the power based on the child's distance refraction, if there's, you know, cylinder, let's say three quarters against the rule or oblique, you can prescribe glasses over. The kids should really wear the lenses as much as they can every day during the week. You look to get about eight to 10 hours a day aware, but they can be worn up to 14 hours a day. And, um, you know, Cooper has a great training program uh, to start you in your myopia management uh, skills. Let's look at their study. Um, so they also did a three-year randomized clinical trial, and then they did a crossover. Um, they took the control group and they fit them into the lenses, at, you know, after that, which is, you know, always, you know, a nice thing to do because you want to give the control kids the benefit once they saw how amazing the results were. So look at these results. There was a statistically significant reduction of about three quarters of a diopter in um, spherical equivalent refraction at three years, so 59%. And there was a reduction in axial length of 52% um, versus the control. So that's the nice sight wearers versus the control wearers. 
And so these are statistics that we're familiar with, both from the orthoperitology space, um, from the atropine space, and now we see from the soft lens space as well. Six year data was equally good. And again, the control group, control group is refit into the dual focus lens in year four. And nearly one in four remained stable after the six years. So that means not only didn't their myopia increase, um, you know, by, by a less amount, they didn't increase at all. And 23% um, of eyes after six years displayed a total refractive change of less than a quarter of a diopter. One of the things that Cooper wanted to, or has made clear as well, is that the newest findings suggest that while intervention at an early age is optimal, don't, whenever you can start, it's the right time. So it's not too late. You know, if you can slow it down, slow it down. I've had kids come in, minus 250, minus three, fine. So I didn't bring them a year earlier, but we're gonna make this happen. So let's, um, you know, we're getting towards the end and I wanna wrap up with, you know, more of the fun stuff. Not that that wasn't fun. Right? Um, I'm gonna go over some unique applications, uh, both now and what's just about to come out of the pipeline. So there are four areas that I'm gonna cover. One is ocular surface restoration, piggyback and reverse piggyback, drug, drug delivery and biosensing. So we're gonna start with the piggybacking. And this is a topic, look, we have squirrels now. A lot of us have abandoned piggybacking, but I will tell you it is still a wonderful tool. There are two ways to do it. I always use daily disposables. Um, you can either um, fit your hard lens to the cornea and slide the lens under, or you can reverse it and um, you can put the soft lens on top and then measure. But the, what I wanted to make clear here or point out to you is that you can effectively change the topography a little bit by creatively using a soft contact lens. So, you know, if you look here, you have an oblate cornea uh, up here on the right with no lens wear, and then you can put a, you know, a plus a quarter night and day and then a plus six night and day. Look how that central cornea lifts up a little bit. So if you have a post-RK patient and for whatever reason, you're not gonna fit a scleral or some other type of lens, it's a great way to not only improve the comfort of your GP lens, but to build up that cornea. Conversely, you can use a high myopic lens to essentially flatten the relationship or change the relationship between the center cornea uh, and the periphery by using a high minus lens. The question I see come up all the time is, okay, well, what does that do to the power? The power of the soft lens will be roughly 20%. So you know, unless you're at a six or above, you're not gonna change it that much. Um, the other thing you can do with soft lens is if you are fitting sclerals and you don't have the power in stock and you wanted to show, most of us wouldn't have the power in stock, you wanted to show what the lens division is gonna be when they come to pick up their lens, put a soft lens right on top of the scleral with that over refraction and you know, you have a nice wow factor. So what about drug, drug, drug delivery? I mean, this is a topic probably for, um, you know, you could do a whole lecture on this, uh, but what's coming out of the pipe? So Johnson & Johnson has been working on this for at least a decade. Um, these lenses are now approved in Canada and Japan. It's their AccuView lens. It's one day for allergy and itch. It is um, infused with cutotifin, which we all know is a great allergy drop. Uh, it's an H1 histamine receptor antagonist. The putotifin is slow released up to five hours for, they say, 12 hours of relief, and it's preservative-free. So, you know, for our severe allergy sufferers, not only will we be putting them in dailies, um, but we can put them in TheraVision, and it doesn't mean they're going to have to wear the lens all spring or summer. We can use this so that we're not pouring drops in over the lens as we are now. So biosensing, um, the triggerfish was uh, launched in, or, or FDA approved in 2016. It can detect 24 hours of change in the uh, intraocular pressure. It's not, you can't compare it to the traditional measures of pressure, but it's a nice tool. It's not commercialized yet. Uh, it uses a disposal, daily disposable hydrogel. It's got a strain gauge. So when the, the eye shape changes due to pressure, 
It picks that up, transmits it to an antenna that fits around the sclera, and then it goes into a computer where everything is analyzed. Um, so that, you know, we may see that in some glaucoma practices uh, in the not too distant future. So just to wrap up with a little practice management stuff here, uh, one of the questions I get is, well, okay, so how many fit sets do I need? Um, and that's, you know, that's the issue, especially if you're like me or Manhattan in this little room. Um, so I like to break it down into workhorse and problem solvers. I like to work with one FEMA and one sci in each category. Um, I look for the ranges. Uh, when I look at torix, I want to have lenses that don't necessarily have the same method of stabilization because if a lens is rotating, I want to choose a lens that is stabilized a little bit differently. When I deal with multifocals, at least two designs. Now, does it mean that's the only lenses I use? No, I work with all of them, but I may not store them all. So if I think I need a lens that I don't have a fitting set for, I just go ahead and order the trial. So, you know, pick your workhorse and your problem solver, but don't exclude the other brands. Uh, make sure you work with them all. And certainly for myopia control, I use both the natural view and the my site. So here's my resonant clinical selection strategy. And I didn't list it by brand because I, you can argue this, you know, till kingdom come. And it's not really an argument, it's a discussion. You're going to find what works best for you, but the key is this. Take a careful case history, understand the difference between contact lens discomfort and, and dry eye. They're different. I advise you or I suggest you read the TFAS uh, article on that and it'll explain it. But when there's contact lens discomfort and no clinical signs of dry eye, I like to go with a HEMA or a low modulus sci high or a lens that might elude something or be packaged in, um, in wetting agents. When I have true dry eye, and I've clinically seen that with inflammadry and um, you know, some of the other tear osmolarity and staining, I'm gonna go more towards my surface active technologies. You know, wrap it up, environmental impact. More and more patients are coming in saying, you know what, I'd like to go to, there are a few left that are in dailies in my practice. And interestingly, the ones that aren't, the ones that are really environmentally conscious. So I explained to them that they don't have to be, but they do have to dispose of them properly. We do have to educate our patients. Um, we don't want them throwing them, you know, flushing them down the toilet. Um, I love to share this information that the weight of an annual supply would be about two and a half credit cards of garbage. So they understand that they're not disposing of that much. The companies have really risen to the occasion. We have one by one by Bausch and Lomb. They work with TerraCycle. We keep the boxes in our office. Patients come here to dump. Um, but it's nice because, you know, they come in. Sometimes they'll go into the optical. So anytime they want to come, you're welcome. And Cooper Vision does a great job with Met Plastic Neutral Initiative. Uh, they do both the Clarity and the My Day. They will take all the lenses you dispense or order or supply with patients, and they will extract out through a company called Plastic Bank, equal to the weight of the plastic. So lens out, you know, lens in the garbage, plastic out of the ocean. You can download these wonderful tools, uh, fact sheets from the uh, AOA. J&J has one on their site. I'm sure all the manufacturers have one or make your own, but it's really nice. Uh, to have a little tear off pad, especially when you're refitting your uh, patients to daily disposables. So just a word about the cost hurdle, discuss the value before the cost, look at the patient in the eye, don't look shy or afraid. Um, most complications are due to dirty lenses. Share that daily disposable lenses are 12 and a half times safer and then break down the numbers for them. I'll have somebody up front break them down. And as Dr. Quinn says, if you don't throw away the lenses, you throw away the benefits. Compete on service. We do free ship to home. We replace torn or defective. You know, we exchange boxes. We assist with rebates. But look into some of the prescription platforms now. Uh, all of the companies, a lot of them, have, all of the distributors, I should say, offer them. Um, and some of the companies do as well. Uh, there are numbers. There's uh, CLX. There's Marlowe. 
Um, they, they go by various names, but they really work well tying the patient to your office and uh, making sure they're compliant with the replacement frequency. So just gonna wrap it up, practice growth. Who are you gonna pick for your dailies? Well, everybody, because all patients are candidates for single use lenses, a must for children, adolescents, part-time wearers. Know your contact lenses, know your materials and designs so that when you get your, do your great clinical evaluation, you're led at least to a plan A and a plan B if needed a plan C and work with at least two different brands in each modality. You need to recognize the reasons why patients have not yet moved to daily disposables ahead of time, assuming it's not you, and be ready for the discussion. So I thank you and I hope you've had, had some fun. <laughs>